Hello and welcome to The Last Standee, a board game podcast coming to you from three exciting countries across Europe. I'm joined here today by Audrey. Hello everyone. And Cara. Konnichiwa. We're your host, Ven, and today we're going to be talking about some really, really pretty games with Tokaido Brew and Bees. But before we get into that, it's time for the last Andy catch up. And what's been up with you, Kara? Um, well, the, the last I'm creating a um, role playing character for a role playing game, a German role play game, Splitter Mond. Uh, Splitter Moon would be the translation. Or splittered moon and um god it's been a while since i created a role-playing character <laughs> your system is, is quite a lot of work i realized or can be quite a lot of work so reading a lot of rules and um story and whatnot um yeah apart from that i um, decided to change one thing for in game nights when i'm instead of sitting down and asking people okay what do you want to play and then they look at my collection and no one can decide and we sit there for one one and a half hours without playing anything until someone finally decides on something i'll pre-select a handful of games and um we just choose between them which uh, also means i can read the rules for them beforehand so that should be helpful and i'm i'm really proud of this discovery <laughs> yeah it's very close to what we do here when we go to the club uh on the saturday evenings board game uh, bag and we go and we pick up games that we know are fast enough to explain and fit the, the club so yeah having a first selection is is a life changer <laughs> and a time saver <laughs> yeah definitely and i i actually tried it out on um but I just picked two games, took them with me, and I said, hey, here, I have these two games. And they immediately were, oh, yeah, we can play them. And that was it. So no discussion whatsoever. And that's, it's just great <laughs> when you just, you know, get to play. Yeah, that's, um, that's pretty. Uh, the general rule was everyone bought one or two games they're interested in playing. Um, and some people just never brought games because they didn't buy them. They just played, which is great uh and then we'd uh, pop them on the table and usually pick like a main event game and then like a one or two fillers fillers and that was about it works pretty well Fan, that actually leads me to a maybe weird maybe uncomfortable question you just said you know there are some people who didn't buy games only played and i actually i i at some point i did wonder and i actually I, I, at some point, I did wonder in, in my gaming group, everyone plays, uh, buys games, but um, is it fair if like one person invests a lot of money into this hobby and others, you know, just enjoy playing it without having to invest money into this hobby and others, you know, just enjoy playing it without having to invest anything? Uh, I think it's perfectly fair. I mean, it's a game is a social experience. I'm not buying the game, um, at least for me, within the purpose of, oh, I'll buy this game, you buy this game, you buy this game. I also, so, oh, I'll buy this game, you buy this game, you buy this game. I also like to own the game. So, you know, I have plenty of people I play with, I play games and they don't own them or we don't play their copies or so on. And it's just, it's just the way it is. Uh, so... Maybe some other people might not feel uh, so. Maybe some other people might not feel so. I don't know, socialist about it. But I figure, uh, you know, a gaming can afford to support people who don't buy games or buy few games for a bunch of different circumstances. A uh, good example would be one of my friends from a role playing group. A uh, good example would be one of my friends from a role playing group. Uh, because he's long-term incapacitated, he has very little money, so he can't afford to buy games. Uh, I don't begrudge it. He plays, you know, every week with us. Oh yeah, I mean, if if uh, if someone you know d doesn't have the money, I wouldn't say, hey, you're stupid. And but um, I, I, I it, it's really something I, I wonder about sometimes. Like if people would have the money, 
and uh, when I host game night I also buy, buy snacks and drinks and stuff and um, yeah the, the, I don't know it's it kind of if um, one would share the costs to a certain degree mm. well I can say for certain when it comes to snacks and stuff uh, you're on your own with me get your own stuff partly because I can't eat mm, the same snacks as anyone else because I can't consume any sugars or carbohydrates um which is uh so but I've, we've always been like that of that kind of stuff uh, you bring your own and if you want to share with other people and often people do then that's great uh but yeah I, i've not really ever thought too much about it as somebody who i like buying games and then organizing them by color <gasps> and size <laughs> buying games and then organizing them by color <gasps> and size <laughs> oh, but by so, color is such a pretty thing to do. It is. It, you do get a bit of a problem when you have stuff like um, like the Red Raven series, where the you know above and below and near and far and now and never are all three very distinct colors. But you really shouldn't keep now and never are all three very distinct colors. But you really shouldn't keep them anywhere other than next to each other. So that's. Uh, but yeah, it's um. Definitely like to trend my collection going like black through the rainbow and then up to white uh, when I can. That's actually something w w one friend from my gaming group uh, where I was on Monday. He doesn't sort his sh board games in any way. And um, so he actually has like Legends of Andor, um, all three parts. And they are all in different, was standing in front of his shelf and was like, what are you doing? Why? <laughs> and look, here you have Ian's End and down there are the expansions. And <laughs> yeah, it's... Um, yeah, I, I hmm. will not speak too much because my shelves are like half organized, like there is the... Um, I use the IKEA uh, square where there is uh, both Eonzen and Spirit Island and Terraforming Mars, which is like the slightly expert uh, square. Uh, I have one where there is Colt Express and Takenoko, which is how I can play this with whoever. It's more by type of game here. So Yeah, yeah it makes sense. As long as you've got a system. As long as you've got a system. That's really, you know, and sometimes those games just buck the system. A lot of the games that sit in my office, they're far too large for the shelving situation I use upstairs because they are long. And I've only got so much space to put long games on top of the cupboards I use. Uh, and that, that, so it's kind of games on top of the cupboards I use. Uh, and that, that, so it's kind of mayhem down here. But upstairs is a, a gradually increasing more and more order. And that's what matters more than anything, as far as I'm concerned, is my ability to find something. Um, yeah, I, I've gone for pleasing colours, but there's also... Yeah, I, I've gone for pleasing colours, but there's also like a bit of a theming wherever possible. Um, I, I do have a closed cupboard that, for example, contains all movie tie-in games. So it's got like The Thing, uh, Egg Infection Outpost th uh, 31, and Aliens... And all of those, like, uh, but yeah, um, I, I, th I don't care as long as you organize it in some fashion. I don't, I think it's crazy to have the expansions to a game sitting very far away from where the game is, because then like, you're going to pick up the game and play that and forget about the expansions or you just like, why not get, just get the expansions? Well, anyway, uh, Audrey, what about you? What have you been up to? Uh, me? I can attest that I have reached a stage three of uh, Cat is Hot. Uh, because he has found uh, new places to hide. Uh, that's not a board game thing because he is looking at me from the inside of the cupboard where he uh, sleeps now. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, uh, that's the first uh, silly thing. Then um, I have found a new job, which I'm going to be starting very soon already when we record. So I think when this episode is published, I will be working. <laughs> I think when this episode is published, I will be working. <laughs> So, which is uh, very good news. Uh, the project is very interesting. Um, on the board game front, uh, I don't really have much to say now because uh, last weekend my parents were there and we played bees. Uh, uh, 
last weekend my parents were there and we played bees uh, and well as friend already mentioned bees is going to be uh, one of our topics so I'm going to save my parents reaction for when we talk about bees <laughs> Um, there is, however, a subject that I want to a subject that I want to talk about just a bit. Uh, it's that when we record uh, that episode, the pledge manager for Midara uh, Wave Two, let's say, of the current Kickstarter, has been open for a few hours or days, and there are a few interesting things in there. I, I personally think charging shipping for now. They want to wait until they're getting close to wave to shipping, which they estimate to be around December. And so they said that we can probably look up to uh, shipping being started uh, in autumn. I think that's a smart move. Uh, running lots of stuff for pledge manager reopenings, apparently. Uh, but yeah, I think that uh, as the situation right now is still super volatile, charging shipping close to the shipping date, uh, is very smart and I hope that we can get to see more companies doing that. It's going to be something that in general backer can, uh, let's say, appreciate. Yeah, definitely. Um, I know a lot of people com complain about it, or at least some people complain about it, because they you know, want to know how much they have to pay now. But um, I mean, we've seen it in different projects that either they have to charge more later or they even might have to reimburse people or um, or they take a big loss so yeah uh, I was part of the Black Rose Wars uh, Kickstarter from Ludus Magnus Studio and they had at some point they asked uh, we they asked only willing backers to uh, to have their stuff shipped first and to help the shipping happen just at all and yeah I think that waiting until shipping happens is a good idea to avoid that kind uh, of things but also avoid too much delay also helps avoiding that <laughs> also they're still offering increased a bit so i think that they have a bit uh, let's say either a bit thorough assessment of the exact amount of components and how much things are going to cost uh, and our price uh, of components has increased which i is probably part of it um, and that, that's something that I saw that confused many people because there are two different packs. There is a compatibility pack and the update pack. And the compatibility pack is like if you ha if you bought in the Kickstarter, uh, um, oh, what's the name? Uh, Acts uh, 2 or and or 3, um, you will get the compatibility pack. Replace uh, specific cards, specific rule uh, places, uh, maybe stickers to put in the rule book. I don't know. Uh, to just update it a bit. And this one will be included for no extra charge to everyone who has Act 2 and or 3 in their pledge. But then there is the up 3 in their pledge. But then there is the update pack. And as far as I understood, this update pack is mostly a pack in which you get the rule book and all the cards of Act 1 updated to fit the 1.2 version and uh, Act 2 and 3 will be uh, fitting for, will be adapted to, Act 2 and 3 will be uh, fitting for, will be adapted to uh, 1.2 version. But for most of the cards that are changed, the, ma the major changes are adding uh, at some places the version number. And I think that's a way, that's an, in my opinion, that's an incredible I think that's a way, that's an, in my opinion, that's an incredible waste. Actually, you are you are, you are buying a full set of cards, a full rule book, to have version numbers. I think that either they missed explaining something, or if it's just that, it's an uh, for me, it's an ecological disaster. But then we are speaking about more or a bit less. We don't know, but yeah, I'm still puzzled by the explanations that were done about uh, that one. It's a bit confusing, and yeah. Uh, all cards in a new version when sometimes it's mo mostly the version number added I, I'm a bit uh, let's say um, yeah apparently at some points there are a few let's say calculations that changes so uh, it, something that will affect probabilities or some stuff and apparently shift a bit the difficulty of some stuff but it shouldn't matter much if you have version 1.1 so 
yeah. I, I don't know, but uh, I'm comfortable with full set of cards and a rule book for I think it was it's twenty dollar. It's not too expensive uh, for people that want it, but yeah, the uh, repercussions I don't know. And the last thing that I wanted to mention is the resin kits. Of and the last thing that I wanted to mention is the resin kits of Midara. So far, there have been now three waves of Midara resin kits. The first wave of ten, which were included in the Kickstarter and pledges, uh, but you could or could not pick up depending on your funds and how you like them, etc., etc. Could or could not pick up depending on your funds and how you like them, etc., etc. The second resin kit, which was basically the Valentine's 2021 uh, release, even though it didn't happen at Valentine's, and the Valentine's uh, resin kit of 2022, which didn't happen for Valentine, either they call them the Looper Kelly and they're supposed to be for Valentine's, but Valentine, either they call them the Looper Kelly and they're supposed to be for Valentine's, but anyway. And so these are packs with resin, so 10 for the first ones and 4 packs uh, for the uh, two later ones, which includes all the time uh, as well few cards if you want to have a new adventurer, a new, um, I think some new uh, foes, have a new adventurer, a new, um, I think some new uh, foes, um, etc. Some new gear cards which are promo, etc. And in that Kickstarter reopening, you have two new packs, which are the promo pack for Kickstarter and the Valentine's 2021 pack, which are the same miniatures but redone in Valentine's 2021 pack, which are the same miniatures but redone in plastic, and all the cards of a pack. I think that's thirty dollars ish when each resin pack was hundred dollars in the Kickstarter and then two hundred for the first one and. $100 for then for the 2021 and 2022 bucks. And I think that's really amazing to see a company making the promo content available for a smaller price than with the resin, uh, let's say, limited kit, because as they mentioned as well, they don't have yet any plan to have the resins again. So I think that uh, having that available for the people that want the gameplay content is a good move. And you still have a miniature, although in plastic and not in the best plastic. Uh, so if you want to have a miniature in your on your game, uh, you know, on your table, that that goes with it. So I think that if we should do the same kind of things. I'm not going to name them because. I think our listeners should know based from past discussion who I am talking about, right? Uh, I think so. Yeah. <laughs> I, I guess I, I'm. Um, I'm. Uh, I think so. Yeah. <laughs> I, I guess I, I'm. Um, I'm like the equivalent of not a late backer but i'm somebody who picked up um act one when it first hit their store uh so i was able to get it with all of the kickstarter stuff just for a bit more of a price and i at this point for a bit more of a price and i at this point now i still can't decide if i want to go on to act two and three um i've been looking through this page for a while one of the things i have noticed is they've increased the number of um play mats they get that that you can buy yeah and i, I um, oh yes i forgot that i i uh, so i said um, oh yes i forgot that i i uh, so i semi hate it because now as the playmates uh, fit future characters that you can play it's a spoiler it is it is but it also isn't because if you look through that list of characters that are extra ones um most of them are in act one um except uh, they've already spoiled like a couple of sections of the plot quite heavily um, in the Kickstarter. Uh, if you've been fortunate and not seen them, that's fine. I avoided um, all the spoilers. Yeah, it's it's a bit weird because I'm looking at it and they've got a playmat of ten characters, uh, you know, which you've seen, and I'm like, uh, some of these could just be dead. Um, I don't know. No spoilers. So, so <laughs> I'm not. I'm not spoiling you. It's not. It's not a spoiler that, so, depending on your choices, some characters can live or die because that's the print part of the principle of Midara. I'm looking at them going. Well, there's ten characters. You could be entering Act Two with like, uh, I think maybe three of them alive. So uh, not ten, but out of the ones you start with, that is quite possible. Uh, and it's sort of. I expected to see more play mats. Um, uh, especially given that I'm looking at these characters um, and 
I only really like three of them. I, I would have expected new playmats and the bags, the tug bags, uh, neutral. The new playmats and the bags, the tug bags, uh, neutral. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe they could have put some like question marks over it all, uh, or you know, or a here's a non-spoiler image and here's a spoiler image or something. Um, yeah, and that puts me in an odd spot as well because I own four of the. Um, yeah, and that puts me in an odd spot as well because I own four of the playmats and I'm like, well, do I need? Should I get the other six? And then that's like, I start trending towards, well, do I get? What, what bundle do I go for? Because to be honest, I kind of just want to get the Act 2 and 3 bundle because it's the cheapest. Um, but then I do have the playmats and bags for one lot kicking around. I'll probably be okay with that. I've got to figure out in particular what might not be available um, in the store in the future. Because, I mean, a, a lot of this has done and I don't I don't know. I think but... I've seen the playmats uh, on supply uh, quantity. Mm, no. No, they, I mean, they weren't. I mean, the, go on, sorry. They they did, on multiple occasions, say they don't want to, you know, make things um, unavailable later on. Like, they don't want to release something that you have to get now and can't get later. Um, so everything, maybe except uh, resin releases, um, to be available at their store later on. Yeah, and, and since it happened already, why not happen again? <laughs> Um, I, I, I am seeing one thing which I think is worth paying attention to is this uh, Lupercalia 2021 Lupercalia 2021 pack. This is like a pack of all of the previous ha uh, Valentine's Day releases, uh, but in plastic. And it's like $30 for the plastic pack in full, whereas separately I paid way more than that for them. Yeah, I think it was €25, um, Euro, uh, the single box, and there were four of them, or maybe €35, mm. Euro, uh, the single box, and there were four of them, or maybe $30 a box. I, yeah, I, I got the, the bundle of them all together, and it, it was a bit of a mare to get because there was casting problems, but they sorted it out, uh, and... I will say that their distribution into Europe has been very good and very transparent. Like I knew it's been very good and very transparent. Like I knew where they were all the times with um, where my replacements were going. Um, so I knew what time they were arriving and everything. So uh, casting mistakes happen. That's no problem. They sorted out really well. But I am looking at that and I'm like, I, d I don't think I'm going to touch and getting the wolf $30 as opposed to $120 for they are if you bought them all separately also in my opinion from the previous pack and all of the extra bits and pieces i've got i don't think any of this extra stuff's particularly great you don't get more characters for the main story you get some more like alternate characters for play the four main characters who they're nicer sculpts than the plastic ones um yeah but although they said they're updating the the sculpts for this next wave you know the the new stuff is going to be higher quality in plastic which um, I look forward to. But yeah, I, I think I'm making a decision in the first week of July as to what budget constraints is. I might just ask for Act 2 and 3 bundle as my birthday present. Uh, yeah, like eventually. <laughs> um, although well, they do seem to get stuff out like faster. What are they promising? Like quarter four uh, here for back, uh, the net wave two items. Which, yeah, for back, uh, the net wave two items. Which, yeah, yeah, that's that's not too bad to, you know, order it in July and get it December. Yeah. If we get it in December. I, it, yeah. It seems yeah, th optimistic. December is a sh bad shipping month. <laughs> it is, it is. Yeah, it's a sh bad shipping month. <laughs> it is, it is. Yeah, here I'm probably going to just uh, not add anything. Well, the playmats we talked a bit uh, why, uh, the tag bags as well, and I had the with swag uh, pledge level, so I don't need. We never need anything anyway. Pledge level, so I don't need. We never need anything anyway, uh, but I definitely don't, and I'm going to keep money for um, if. Uh, that that Kickstarter comes available in French, the Queen's Dilemma. But I'm not sure it's going to be available in French during the Kickstarter. Queen's Dilemma. But I'm not sure it's going to be available in French during the Kickstarter. Yeah, probably not during the Kickstarter. We'll have to have to see on that one. But uh, yeah, that's um, 
that's a lot of thoughts about the Badara pledge opening, and um, it's confusing. There are many uh, oh, there... opening, and um, it's confusing. There are many, uh, oh, there are many oh. items, and that in itself can be confusing. But I have to say that I like that when you are in the ad. Uh, extra add-ons, well, edit add-on section, you can uh, see all which which is in your pledge uh, on the right uh, side of the page, that whether you are on computer or on a mobile phone, you can see what you already have and check it. Um, I'm just going to add one thing, which is that if you're not in the pledge and you're like a late pledger, like I would technically be for this, you go onto the page, the link that they provide, and there's it's because there's no buttons. You have to click on each individual item, and then you can click add it. It was I, I was expecting to see buttons like straight up there on the different things. So uh, <laughs> the interface for a somebody coming in to just do a late pledge doesn't seem as good as those people who are already in there. But that's the f design this, did they? Yeah. I think we should probably uh, move on from Madara. And I guess it's time for me to ask Fen what Fen's been up to. So what have you been up to, Fen? Yes, tell well, us. Thank you <laughs> very much for asking. That's quite kind of you. You're my favourite person. You're my favourite person. Well, you're not mine. Um, great, thanks. So anyway, um, as I talked about the last few episodes, we've got, like, finally got guests coming. Um Especially they feel more confident in visiting Gotland now um, because of the various political shifts in Gotland now, um, because of the various political shifts. We're not going to get into it, but I'm sure you know what I'm talking about. It's terrible, but at least we're seeing some stability here now. Um, and the electrician's just been today to put the lights in. So this is a nice little wrinkle that put the lights in. So... This is a nice little wrinkle that nobody in the family here knew at all. But in Sweden, if uh, you're going to have a light in your bathroom, it must be installed by an electrician. Like, if it's not, uh, and there's a whole bunch of like, you do that and, it, and you don't have like a receipt that says an electrician did this, you're not going to get insurance if that sparks out and burns the house down. Yeah, yeah, and so, so we're talking about two, you know, two people, uh, who have been alive for quite a few decades. Um, you know, the old folks. Uh, multiple houses constructed on the island, and nobody ever told them that bit of like code, um, building code. So that was like, oh, okay. So we had an electrician round to install the bathroom light over there. Check that the bathroom lights in here are fine. Um, they are. He installed them. So. That's not a problem. If they go, I won't be able to do my job anymore. Yeah. Because everything I, I think about that is everything my job's based around. I need physical access to it, and I, I'm replacing all the stuff that's here. Some of it is irreplaceable, uh, but yeah, at least we're insured, which is the big thing. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Uh, which is the big thing. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Uh, must have been a, at least a small scare, if not more. It was a concern for a bit, but we, it's all sorted out now. And um, the electrician clarified because previously he, we'd been told that he said he wasn't willing to visit the property. Told that he said he wasn't willing to visit the property because uh, the he didn't like the dog, and the dog had to be not on the property uh, if he was coming there. It turns out that's not what he said at all. That was a translation, like uh, mis you know miscommunication through a, a second party who relayed the message to us uh through a, a second party who relayed the message to us uh who and really in truth like he just found her to be fairly funny um and as long as she just stayed out of the way uh while he did his work uh he didn't care oh which is um, pretty different it is well it, it, he kind of understood what happened which is that when he met her it, it, he kind of understood what happened which is that when he met her um, the first time, he, he he didn't move particularly, but he made the mistake of looming over the top of her rather than crouching down, you know, squatting to say hello to a dog or just leaning down and put your hand out. He loomed over her and she got frightened. Leaning down and put your hand out. He loomed over her and she got frightened and snapped at him. And that's all that happened. Uh, 
yeah um so but that's that's all been sorted uh i've been constructing uh, decks for arkham horror for when so we're going to play through at least one of the campaigns the new campaign is kind of fun it's based on mountains of madness and it's lots of um exploring in like a uh, mountainous frozen wasteland and there's a whole bunch of uh, partner characters you know allies that npcs and things change so it's looking interesting it's the first game they did while they're transitioning towards this new system and designing these stories so some people who experienced that i've read have said it's got problems but the people who played it and like they haven't played too much of the old stuff which is what we'll be like or at least most of us will be like that should be fun Although it's uh, it's tiring constructing decks for Arkham. There's the resources are very scattered around, and there's so much of this. Oh, you could build this particular deck, but you need to own these cards. And then there's these guides that some people do, which, and then there's these guides that some people do, which is like here's the core game plus one expansion cycle. You better own the whole cycle, or you can't make the deck because they spread the player cards all the way through. I think we talked a bit about that in the previous episode and how they're changing the distribution model for Arkham and I'm going to get into it sometime when Alessio's here Arkham and I'm going to get into it sometime when Alessio's here in more detail. Uh, apart from that I've been uh, painting a dragon king and a lonely tree. Um, I'm painting death high stuff. Yes yes I, I like death high stuff. It's, yeah. Is that uh... death high stuff? It's... Yeah. Is that uh, Dragon King going to be much different from the one you microwaved? Oh, it's very different. Yes. Yeah. Um, the the one I'm the one I've microwaved uh, isn't going anywhere. That's the one we usually play with. But um, I wanted I've got own two Dragon King in the house right now. <laughs> one of them is for a client. That's finished. I need to get the tree done um, and the tyrant done, and then that can go off. Uh, and then I own two because. Um, there was a period in the UK where people were just selling off Kingdom Death stuff cheap. Um, yeah, it was before the game really went nuts. I owned, I owned like two Gorms, two um, Dung Beetle Knights, two Tyrants. I had technically have three Tyrants, but I famously melted one on camera by accident um, while I was doing some promotional work with Twist. Uh, so I've got one Tyrant missing an arm. Um, so I don't know what to do with him. We have two of each, apart from Spidiculis and the Sunstalker, which I only have one of. Um, which is a shame, because if I had a second Sunstalker, I'd chop the top off it, and I'd uh, mount this um, bust that I found that's like of a um, a shark girl. So I could have a... Uh, you would go with all the pinups, you know? Yeah, I'm going... So I could have a... Uh, you would go with all the pinups, you know? Yeah, I'm going to say not having a second Spidiculus is not uh, too, bad, too big of a problem, but a second Sunstalker could be nice. Yeah, a second Spidiculus is like more or less, hey, just put this base on the ground. Job done. There it is. It's right there. Get yourself some toy spiders to represent them. There it is. It's right there. Get yourself some toy spiders to represent the spiderlings and that's all you need. Uh, but we've, we've waffled for long enough, I think. We should get on to the games themselves. Uh, so I think our first one is a very beautiful, calm and magical journey uh, through... And magical journey uh, through... Uh, it's one of my favourite experiences to just play. Um, it's a very simple game with a surprising amount of depth. Uh, that is Tokaido. Yeah, um, so... Um, I'll start with a bit of background um, talk. Um, I'll start with a bit of background. Um, Tokaido is the name of a um, traveling route in Japan. It is an historic route, um, dates back to medieval times, um, and connected the uh, two important cities of uh, Kyoto and connected the uh, two important cities of uh, Kyoto and Edo, um, now Kyoto and Tokyo. And um, yeah, so um, it exists today. You, still today, you can travel it. Uh, the pictures look beautiful. Pan, maybe take a look. And um, 
Yeah, so it was a um, historic travel route uh, connecting these cities. Um, there's a lot of art and um, culture around it um, as not just a, you know, trade route, but also a route that people took traveling the Tokaido. Um, you start in uh, Kyoto and travel to Edo, though there is a variant where you travel in the different direction. Um, and what first really got me was it looks at first like a race and first, but uh, then you likely will lose because the goal of the game isn't to be the fastest or most powerful or whatever. It, the goal is to have the most fulfilled travel experience, which I just think is beautiful. And um, the, the player who is the farthest, furthest behind uh, may move. Yeah? And so if uh, you're the last in line and in front of you are like two free spaces, you can move twice and then a third time and only then you can move again. So um, yeah, you can really take your time in this game. And um, yeah, that's, that's mostly <laughs> what's there to say about the rules. Um, every space has different effects and there you have, uh, you get uh, money, you have um, hot spring uh, places uh, where you visit a hot, a hot spring and collect a card for that, which gives you points. Um, and my, my most favorite spaces are the uh, panorama spaces where you three different panoramas. One is rice paddies uh, consisting of three different cards. One is a mountain panorama consisting of four cards and one is the ocean panorama consisting of five cards. And uh, each, uh, each uh, additional card gives more points. And um, so yeah, basically scenery and um, yeah, it's it gets more depth. First of all, even at this point, it does actually have quite a lot of depth because you have to decide which place you move to, um, and it can really lead, it can really lead to you sitting there and calculating. Okay, if I move here, then next is this player's turn, and uh, okay, he's collecting panorama, so he likely move there, and then will this player's be this player's turn, and he will probably move there when I can't go there, so I maybe should go there. It's uh, he will probably move there when I can't go there, so I maybe should go there. It's uh, it, it's a brain a brain teaser sometimes, and um, but it gets more depth with uh, individual player powers. Um, so you have different characters you can take that have individual player powers. Um, so you have different characters you can take that have different abilities. Um, you have these nice uh, cards, cardboard. Uh, Cards with artwork and their ability on them, um, like uh, get, like uh, getting additional points for specific things or uh, stuff like that, and um, yeah. And then there are expansions, um, which I, I, you want uh, to have more of a feel of um, having different decisions to make um, because one of the expansions basically adds an alternate action to each space. So every time you reach, uh, you go to a space, you have a choice between two different actions, basically, yeah, doubling your options. And um, the other expansion is actually pretty small. It's the Matsuri expansion that um, just introduces specific events. During the game, there are three special spaces, the um, inns, everyone has to wait for the others. So um, you can't just on your first action move to the finish line. Um, you have to wait at these three points for the others. And once everyone has reached one of these points, with the expansion you draw events. And something has basically some celebration um, that gives 
uh, additional rules or effects to the players and um, yeah that's that's it with this uh, Matsuri expansion um, yeah I really love love this game it's beautiful it's uh, simple to play has a lot of depth to it and um, it's just you know relaxing it's it, you don't have, feel like you're in a hurry to read something or um, there is not really a um, big um, there is not really a um, big feeling of competitiveness um, I mean sure you you can take spaces away from others but it's never like, oh damn, I don't know what I shall do now because this one space I wanted to go to is not available. Never like, oh damn, I don't know what I shall do now because this one space I wanted to go to is not available anymore because you still have many options left and um, there are no bad options. Uh, it's not like, damn, everything I can do now is bad for me. Um, it's, you always have things to do. It's bad for me. Um, it's, you always have things to do and um yeah so based from what from me. based from what you say it makes me think a bit of box um i would say it's it they're, it, they're both definitely games of moving backwards uh, and so you want to pick the best possible spot for you landing on um and also calculate when you're going to get to have a go next so yeah there's definitely some mechanical similarities in those I never remember what the exact mechanic is called for it. Um, but, you know, it's a kind of. Uh, I was going to say yes. Like um, I've played a, a lot of games of Takedo. Um, the fact that I have the app version means it's be pretty easy for me to jump on and just play like for five ten minutes and get a game through. Uh, and what I like about it is really easy to get people into it. It's got a very low like barrier to entry it's just like okay well pick where you'd like to go next on the track just be aware you can't go anywhere someone already is you can't backtrack so you can only move forwards and when you reach an in you've got to purchase a meal and wait for everyone else to catch up you reach an in you've got to purchase a meal and wait for everyone else to catch up which everybody can click with that really um and it's it's always fun there's this strange like exciting ooh moments at every single stop it's like ooh, look at this piece of a panorama this is pretty you, know, you flip it over and you know, oh, i want to complete this or the panorama this is pretty you, know, you flip it over and you know, oh, i want to complete this or you get some nice beautiful the illustrated card for a random encounter with someone uh or um buying the souvenirs every single one of those has like no, beautiful artwork it's very there's a lot of emphasis on a rich experience to try and link the theme with the mechanics. And I think they do a great job of doing that, for sure. Um, I also really like the minimalistic appearance of the main board, which I think contrasts like with parks. Parks are like something to look at. There's always the, the individual cards are all gorgeous, but the board is gorgeous. Um, and Takedo sort of strips that back with a lot of simplicity with this white. Um, so, yeah. Now, I, I, I just want to say, like, there is actually a thing, move to a thing. Um, might not be particularly deep, but that's where, if you play it a lot, there is actually a, 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 a interesting economic engine underneath, where, in essence, the game boils down to converting coins into points. And... As you play it more and more, and as you play it more and more, and I'm not going to spoil everything and go into it all, uh, you'll learn sort of stuff like it's best to buy cheap food at the inn if you can, uh, and you never want to get caught without any money, so pay attention to your money and don't buy things just because you can buy them. Buy them because they don't buy things just because you can buy them. Buy them because they're what you're after and what's valuable, and don't be afraid to skip spaces. Uh, which is all fun. Um, I physically, uh, and I, 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 I own the um, anniversary edition. Um, it's a bit odd though, because I picked the um, anniversary edition. 
Um, it's a bit odd though because I picked it up second hand. So it's the anniversary edition. It's missing the Matsuri expansion and the miniatures. Um, and they've not been available for ages. But the box is designed specifically to hold the trays. And this is designed specifically to hold the trays and use those trays to hold other pieces in place. So every time I open this box and I keep it flat, everything is slid everywhere because there's just there's gaps where there's meant to be more trays fitted in. Um, but weirdly, yeah, on top of all of these fitted in, um, but weirdly, yeah, on top of all of that, I just saw us getting the fifth anniversary edition. Um, it's also got like the uh, the new encounters expansion in there, which is like four extra promotional cards and Eriku, who's a promotional character. So I got a real deal, real deal when I bought it. But it doesn't stop me getting really annoyed that I don't have the Matsuri miniatures. Like the game's perfectly played. I've got all the Matsuri characters for some reason. All of them are in there. The Wait, were they what character? Uh, the Matsuri characters. No, the, no, the, characters. the, the encounter expansion. Yeah, the you know I think it's the three, um, uh, cards themselves, the small ones that came with that. They like they have like Hanabi on them and things like that. It's a separate deck, and I don't have the t tokens, so I don't know what's going on with it at all. Um, but I've been waiting for two years for them to get to Matsuri and the mini these expansions. They're all they're all gone. Yeah, and it's actually what you just mentioned with the fifth anniversary edi edition. If people are looking for this game, there are different versions. Um, and like the core ver standard version is in retail, at least in Germany. Um, I think there is another one as well. Um, but yeah, it's. Uh, it can be a little bit confusing if you, you know, try to figure out how to get everything. Um, um, yeah, I, I just checked. Mine is uh, the collector's edition, and it comes with the Crossroads expansion in it, but and spaces for the other stuff. But it's not meant to have any of the other stuff, which is why I get confused about having half of the stuff from Matsuri. <laughs> yeah, second hand. Uh, there's actually one point of criticism from me. Um, I, I think there are different game boards, uh, like the uh, Deluxe Edition has this game board where it has card spaces on it, uh, which the Retail Edition doesn't have, uh, which the Retail Edition doesn't have, I believe. Can um, confirm that that's the version I have with the card spaces on the board. And um, so it's, it's really big. I just folded it out and it's, it's a huge board. Um, my criticism is the point track. Huge board. Um, my criticism is the point track. The rules, well, from the rules, you're supposed to count your points every time you get them, like immediately and move along the track. But first of all, you basically get points every track. But first of all, you basically get points every time. And so you, you move around a lot on the point track. And um, secondly, the point track zigzags. So it's two rows of numbers and you start in the bottom row then you move um, up and right to a one and then down and right to the two and then up and right to the three. And we got really confused by it, so much so that we decided we will count points at the end. Because <laughs> we, we, several times we sat there and we were like, wait, did, did I move, move correctly now? Just said, whatever, we can count everything at the end, it's no problem. <laughs> Just, yeah. And an interesting tidbit. If you count the spaces on the board, not counting start and end, basically, you know, Kyoto and Tokyo or Edo, um, you have 53 spaces. And uh, that's the number of uh, post offices, post stations along the historic route. So it's actually correct. That's pretty cool. Historic route. So it's 
actually correct. That's pretty cool. <laughs> well, there were actually 53 stops along the way. Yeah, I mean, I think it's to be expected when you look at who designed this. Yeah, I mean, I think it's to be expected when you look at who designed this. Uh, Antoine Bowser, who also gave us Takinoku and Hanabi and Ghost Stories. He, he's very, very on his um, accuracy with these. These. Although he does like, I think he said he's he's not creating complex games anymore, so we're just going to see stuff like Takedo from him going on, and he's definitely stuck to that. It's a lot of Seven Wonders coming out from him. Mm, right. Um, that... I just saw maybe you know something about it. Um, there is a game on Board Game Geek supposed to come out in 2022 called Tokaido Duo Oza Designer. Yeah. Oh yeah, yeah. I know I hadn't I hadn't uh, even seen that. Um, so apparently there is a two player version variant uh, whatever planned. Yeah. I the description's fantastic. In Tokaido Duo you move on an island. Fits perfectly. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, okay. Uh, normally, I like one of them is, says better description needed, but I'm like, really? That's kind of just that sums up to Kaido minus the consumerism. Yeah. <laughs> and it's not on an island. But a different one. <laughs> it's not the same island, let's say. Uh, probably not, yeah. Let's say the first one focuses on the road and the other one apparently focuses on the island. <laughs> so yeah, uh, so maybe something to look out for. Um, I'll try to find out. Yeah, what I'm seeing uh, is... Uh, th this was announced just just this week. Yep, okay, no, to time date this episode, which normally you don't do. The 17th of May is when they announced this. Um... Yeah, Funforge announced it on Facebook. Announced it on Facebook. Yeah. I mean, that's great, guys, but could you also perhaps concentrate on getting the expansions back into print, please? So, dear listeners, if you ever stumble across the Matsuri Minis, please contact us. The Matsuri Minis, please contact us. Fan needs them. Well, I need the whole expansion as well, separately, but... Well, I don't you, need the whole expansion, I need half the expansion. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but I do especially need the miniatures to hold the tray in place, um, so it stops sliding everywhere. So you... Just to hold the tray in place, um, so it stops sliding everywhere. So you mean that you don't need the miniatures from themselves, but to hold the tray in place? Okay, that's not it. Uh... I did, for all of it. So it stops annoying me, so it does its job properly, so the insert works correctly. And then I'd actually paint the miniatures. I'm not painting them when there's only... Then I'd actually paint the miniatures. I'm not painting them when there's only half of them in the box. You should really send me a picture of your insert, because I, I from what you are telling me, it's different than from the Deluxe Edition. And in the Deluxe Edition, there was actually an empty tray for the miniatures. But the miniature an empty tray for the miniatures, but the miniature expansion, the miniatures for the expansion came in their own tray. So I have one over, basically. I, I could get you a tray without the miniatures. <laughs> um, yeah, well, if it's a slightly rectangular tray where they sit in... Um, yeah, well, if it's a slightly rectangular tray where they sit in like two rows, then that's made of white plastic so that would be it um if i could find the miniatures without the tray uh then i'll get back to you but yeah we'll we'll wait and see for the moment i'll just continue to horizontal because if i do that it becomes a real mess anyone knows anywhere that horizontal storage is the only one right <laughs> yeah also um regarding storing the game at least the deluxe edition doesn't fit in a Kallax because ah! it's a very so. Yeah. 
collector's edition is the same. It's uh, it's very wide. It's like 80% of the length of a power grid box, but square and about slightly thicker than that. So it's like your traditional Rio Grande um, rectangular boxes, but it's even worse. That might be the retail edition fits. I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, the retail edition, I think, is a good enough game, especially for people who have non-gamers, for sure. Uh, yeah. Shall we wrap up on Tokaido? Yeah, then? I guess there's nothing more to say than mm. get it when you have the chance. Tokaido? Yeah, I then? guess there's nothing more to say than mm. get it when you have the chance. Yeah, yeah, it's a, a nice, fun, little, relaxing game of taking baths and eating food with a beautiful look. And now we're going to transition to another very beautiful game about brewing potions and training animals. And I'm, I'm going to about brewing potions and training animals. And I'm, I'm going to be saying this near the end, but I'm going to preface this right at the start, okay? Brew, uh, designed by Stevo Torres and published by Pandasaurus Games, is the meanest game I have ever played. It is so mean. And I'll explain why. Why? But first of all, let's just I'm get into the I'm afraid now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, there's a very, like... Um, loose concept that you're in like some kind of fantasy world where time got broke and all the seasons are happening at the same time and uh it's got a cute almost pokemon-esque art style which kind of fits with the whole idea of training animals and everything but it is at its heart a dice work placement game for two to four players with a fair amount of area control um at the start of the game, you'll set up locations on each. Um, two of the lo uh, two of the locations uh, ha any can have any number of dice put in there by different players, so that they can't be blocked. Every other dice location in this game can only be accessed by one player, with the exception of some dice stacking mechanics that are mean as heck. That are mean as heck. Um, then there is a forest deck. This is like. Uh, there'll be one of those for each player plus one more. So two players, three forests, four players, five forests. They also That also determines the length of the game you're going to be playing. Um, once the deck is all through the game you're going to be playing. Um, once the deck is all gone through and all the forests are exhausted, you know you're at the end of the game. So there's more cards for three players and more cards for four players. And then there's like a section of the deck that's specifically two players or, uh, you know, or more. So they're all nicely identified, uh, you know, or more. So they're all nicely identified. There's a deck for the potions. Um, these are worth points. They also have a once per game ability that you can use. A big part of the game is collecting ingredients to brew these potions. And then at some point you'll use winter. Uh, the decks are shuffled, but they're kept face up, so you can always see the animal that's on top to decide if you want to take that one um, and train it. Uh, each character, of which there are four, has six dice. Two of them are white elemental dice. Uh, on the foraging dice, there's two leaves, two rocks, two sticks. And on the elemental dice, there's two fire, two wind and two water. Uh, after you've all set up, you'll have your character, you'll have your dice, you'll have one wild resource, and you'll decide whether you're going to play with special powers, or if it's for gamers, that's probably where you want to go. For more casual players, if you, well, you want to scar them horribly with a very mean game, then you might choose to teach them without the power abilities. A round's very simple. You roll your dice... And then from the start player, initially it's the last person to... And then from the start player, initially it's the last person to brew a cup of coffee. They're the start player. Um, they will take one of their dice, put it on one of the locations, do the ability on the location, just like a worker placement game. Then they can, if they want to, brew a potion, which requires paying the relevant resources from... In brew a potion, which requires paying the relevant resources from ingredients. And that goes into their hand. Or they can play a potion from their hand for its effect and then you just like tip, uh, tuck it underneath your character sheet uh, to show that it's been used and it'll be worth, still be worth points at the end of the game. 
next, and it'll be worth still be worth points at the end of the game. Pretty straightforward. Uh, the locations vary. Uh, some of them let you gather an ingredient. Some of them let you uh, reserve potions. Um, some of them let you train creatures. And if you train a creature, you just pick it from them let you train creatures. And if you train a creature, you just pick it from one of the piles, put it next to you. You're allowed up to three creatures at a time. The f there's one character on their unique power, they're allowed four. Uh, you'll find that people really love training the creatures because they're very weird looking and they also give you more powers. They're very weird looking and they also give you more powers and choices and options so they seem you know it's an easy like get and they're also worth points the big like player interaction portion of the game though are the forest cards so they're divided into the four different seasons some of them they're like split between two seasons which means they can count as either season uh, the seasons matter for purposes of either some animals will do special effects if you place a dice in a given season and also, uh, when you have finished training an animal, when you're like, I'm done with you, um, you board, and if you have a matching forest location, so an autumn tr creature with an autumn forest location, then you can actually release the, that creature into the forest and it will flip over the face down and it's worth more points. So... That's like a nice thing to do. I want to get a forest that matches that season so I can retire it and increase its points. Um, usually I think it like triples the number of points they're worth. Normally they're worth one. I think they go up to three when they're um, properly honed. And then the last thing that happens once everyone's placed all their dice is you do a, placed all their dice is you do a area control battle to check who has one each of the locations and it's fairly simple if you have the majority of your foraging dice uh, in their place then you win that location and you'll get it and it's worth points and you can retire a get it and it's worth points and you can retire a animal there um, uh, you know make you create your own nature reserve and get even more points if there's a tie nobody gets it if there are more white dice or or tied white dice, which are the elemental dice, then nobody gets it as well. So dice, which are the elemental dice, then nobody gets it as well. So it is this kind of, it's this combination of Euro game action blocking. And then on top of that, there's this push and pull of going for locations that starts to put a lot of tension between each other player. Starts to put a lot of tension between each other player. But then you get to uh, the night side of the board and it changes what's going on. And one of the spaces is to scorch all empty squares in one forest. And scorching is a mechanic with empty squares in one forest. And scorching is a mechanic where you take a square and you put a little fire token in it and that action space can't be placed in by anyone. It's been scorched, it's been burnt to the ground. Uh, and that kind of blocks people from going to places they might want to use. It can shut people out from getting access to shut people out from getting access to uh, like area control or even a resource they need. And that's where this game gets very mean because suddenly you're not just somebody going, oh, hey, you've taken that space I wanted to go to or hey, I wanted to train that animal. Um, you've also got somebody walking in and um, and then somebody else looking and going, you'd think that, but I could put my dice on top of yours and it's mine now. And uh, in a two player game, it's interesting because it creates a lot of tension and it's rare that you get a two player area control game. Um, sometimes you'll be playing it and one of the players will suddenly pipe up and go, could you two stop picking on me? Because... Like everything I'm doing, you're you're both like shutting me off from it on treading on me and I've got the least points and I'm not able to do anything. I'm not having any fun. The players will suddenly be like, oh, heck, we weren't even thinking of that. We were just doing stuff. Or you have games with very, um, shall we say, players who tend to hold grudges and suddenly 
the, the forest will be getting burnt down all over the place and people will be like burning over each other's dice or stacking on top of them and it will be like burning over each other's dice or stacking on top of them and it gets really cutthroat. So it's it's very much down to the playgroup, uh, but it, it escalates fast. If one person's being mean, then it, that's it. It's time for everybody to be mean. So, yeah, it's, uh, it's a really pretty game. It yeah, it's... Uh, it's a really pretty game. It looks like it should be accessible for the family and for children. And uh, <laughs> you've got to play nice, otherwise it is, um, it's bad times. It's mean times. Uh, my biggest downside with this is, first of all, it's Pandasaurus Games. They have standardised box sizes, which is great. This box is the same size as Dinosaur Roll and Right and Makikoro, uh, which is great. Uh, it sits on the shelf with them absolutely brilliantly, but it has one of the worst inserts I've ever seen. I, I'm not joking. Uh, it tend to be a bit spotty with their inserts anyway. Uh, this one has, it has like a space for cards and it has a space for the larger cards that come in the game. And then it has a square area that I guess is for the dice. So you're left with six different types of tokens. Can we describe it as a four leaf clover? Uh, it's four triangles joined together with a circle in the middle. They're all one area. So you can't separate the tokens at all. You just, you can't. And it drives me absolutely bonkers. And as a consequence, I've had to come to... And as a consequence, I've had to come to the solution of putting everything in baggies across, like, almost every single piece. There we are. I've shared in the chat for the others. That's the insert. Like. Like. I, I, I meant to put six different types of tokens into that space. Um. I, 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 is, is this an insert for a different game? I, I don't understand insert for a different game i i don't understand do you I, want the tokens to be separated that's the important question <laughs> well they they yes some of them are wild tokens some of them are points tokens there's three different types of ingredients and scorch tokens and a first player token yeah. so really yes you ideally would have first player token yeah. so really yes you ideally would have one whale for the cards one whale for the larger cards which are sat underneath those dice bags and then, like, either an area for all the dice or four slots for each of the different players' dice. And then five, six wells for, for all of them. They could have done five, six wells for, for all of them. They could have done it. So it feels almost like they appropriated a, a insert from another game. But I don't know what game. Unless there's, like, an expansion coming where you put this cross thing on the middle of the board. i got no idea. It's bored. I got no idea. It's. I hate it, and it's made of plastic, so I don't want to throw it out because plastic in inserts is not often recyclable. So I don't know. That's Pandasaurus is terrible for this. They're rolling right. A um, ton of extra spaces in it that don't have any components to go in, and that might be future proofing for expansions, which is fine. But this one. Such a pretty game and such an ugly insert. But yeah, that is Brew. You know what you're doing? You can get going in about 30 minutes. I can get game done 30 minutes, maybe 45 minutes to an hour if it's all four players. Uh, but um, yeah, if you're playing with people who might get upset about things, bad things happening to them, uh, maybe give this one a pass. If you like being really mean to your friends when playing, there's some really sharp teeth. Yeah, not for, not for me, not for me. <laughs> I haven't decided if it's for me yet. <laughs> uh, we're we're going to play it in June uh, when the guys are down and see how it goes. Um, uh, luckily, the, the one of us who gets the most upset about people, uh, the highest level of screaming across the table isn't going to happen. And yes, he has actually, when we play Shadowhunters, he screamed and yelled at everyone uh, at one point. <laughs> we had to talk to him about that. It's like... Not cool, this is a game about 
like killing each other. It's going to happen. If somebody attacks you or takes your stuff, that's part of the game. I would be giving it like a 7 out of 10, but I'm taking a point off for that terrible insert because it's bad for the environment and it's ugly as heck and it's useless and it annoys me. So, uh, 6 out of 10 for me, but good game. Definitely mechanically solid. That little bloop about it, we're going to um, scurry along to what are hopefully some um, more normal animals being more pleasant to each other, maybe, as uh, Audrey tells us all about bees. Yes, bees, a game from Dan Halstad, illustrated by Chris Williams. And is a pretty, let's say, bucolic game. It's about playing a bee and recolting pollen and to convert it into uh, honey. So the game is played into three phases where players take turns. The first phase is the flight plan, where you decide where your bee is going to go. On uh, where you end up landing, you will take pollen if there is some to take. And you won't take pollen if there is no pollen to take. Uh, that's a bit obvious, but it has to be uh, said. And then uh, placing the pollen uh, wood tokens that you uh, harvested on your um, you, uh, harvested on your um, um, honey making uh, play uh, board. And we at the end of the game, you will uh, ah. At the end of the game, these uh, honey tokens will be converted, these pollen tokens will be converted into honey, aka victory points. These pollen tokens will be converted into honey, aka victory points. So, as it stands, the, the game is pretty simple. These three phases, uh, I think, explained that way, are pretty easy to understand. It's like m many games actually make a plan, uh, get tokens, and use these tokens to make a combination of uh, some sort. And then use these tokens to make a combination of uh, some sort. The thing with B is that the very first uh, part is um, the flight plan. So the flight plan is uh, how to move your bee on the hexagonal grid, uh, which is composed of some uh, leaves. When you want to move your bee, you have to look at uh, its base. The base of the bee is hexagonal, just as uh, the grid. Are the which, who is written uh, on all the flowers, and on each side of that, at the head of the bee, there is a uh, zero written, or a O uh, crossed. On the two sides of this, so left front and right front, you have one slash five on both sides. Then on the two uh, backward sides, so left back and right back, two slash four, and behind the bee, there is written there is a free written. So this means that alongside each of these directions, the B can move of this amount of uh, hexagons in that direction, always in a straight direction, no uh, turning around. So that means that the B can't move forward in direction, no uh, turning around. So that means that the B can't move forward. It can move backward of three spaces. It can move forward left of forward right of one or five spaces, it's not one, two, five, and it can move back left or back right on two or four squares. So that's how you decide where you can or four squares. So that's how you decide where you can go. You, 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 could, you could even make a kind of a plastic pattern or paper or whichever materials you like, uh, make it like the size of the hexagons and have it uh, with the length corresponding to the movements you can you make one for the one and five one and two corresponding to the movements you can you make one for the one and five one and two and one for the five and four movements and you could even put them on your uh, B to see where you can end up. Once you have selected from these distances where you want to go, you will turn the B so that the B is where you want to go. You will turn the B so that the B looks in that direction and then do the movement. That part was very confusing for my parents. Because when you turn the B, the figures that correspond to the movement that you want to do aren't aligned anymore. Those that correspond to the movement that you want to do aren't aligned anymore with the movement that you want to do. 
And so they had trouble remembering and keeping track of what uh, movements they were doing. So after you move, uh, you rotate the bee, you can move in a uh, certain amount of uh, spaces in the direction and depending on where the bee lands, if this hexagon is, collected, is connected to a pollen token, you get that pollen token and you can place it on your board. So if the bee lands in the center of the flower when the setup of the game is made, there is a big uh, pollen token. And the first bee that ends up at the center of the flower gets the big pollen token and one of the smallest ones around. There are three small uh, pollen tokens for each flower. So the bee takes the big one and one of them. Now, when you put the pollen uh, tokens on the board, what do you do with them? So first, the board is, uh, again, as well hexagon shaped. And there are different rows. The first row is uh, composed of, I think it's five. five. And on each row, there, is, there are numbers written. These numbers correspond to spaces that the bee can move. And when you, do, uh, when you pick up a pollen token, you have to put it in a space that has the figures uh, written that your bee just did. It has the figures uh, written that your bee just did. So that means that when you put the tokens uh, in the board, you have to think a bit about where you want to put it. So the middle row is one. Then the two uh, rows around the middle one are two and three, and the two final rows are four and five, three, and the two final rows are four and five. So uh, that means that you can do some patterns with the pollen. And these patterns are going to be things that can score you points. Now, how? During the game, uh, at the end of the game setup, there are three objectives that are going to do this pattern, which can be three pollen in a triangle uh, pattern or in a semicircle pattern, etc., of the same color. Because yes, the pollen have colors corresponding to the flowers they come from. A pollen coming from yellow uh, petals from a flower will be yellow, and from the center of the flower will be teal. And so you will put this pollen on the board, trying to make the patterns that fit with that first uh, common objective. Or there is the second objective, which is um, generally like filling lines or filling the outside of the board or something like that. And you will get points if you have, you will get two points, for instance, for each teal pollen that you have at the end of the game. And each player gets one uh, of each objective file, keeps two and discards the last one. So as in many games, you will have some common objectives the last one. So as in many games, you will have some common objectives and some personal objectives. So based from the common objectives, you can see where the other players are going, if you are interested in that. Or you can just say, oh, I don't care what my uh, opponents are doing, I'm just going to move my bee around and uh, harvest. My, uh, opponents are doing, I'm just going to move my bee around and uh, harvest pollen. Now, how does the game end? The first player to harvest uh, 12 pollen starts the end of the game. The turn ends and then the game is over. As it can happen that you harvest two pollen at a time, the ending player can end up with 13 pollen and not 12. So there are slots at the top of the board where we have another wooden token that we move along and we are supposed to move each uh, one step to the right each time we harvest uh, one pollen. We really had trouble. It's very hard to think about, yeah, I'm getting one pollen, I'm putting this on my board and then I'm moving that uh, space where actually you can, you can just at each time uh, count again as many, uh, how many pollen you have on your board and just say, oh, okay, I need two more and then that's the game end if I'm the one triggering it. So I don't feel that this, but I'd, I'm sure some other people uh, use it and use it well. <laughs> And so that's uh, most of bees. Um, 
I think that getting the B movement right is the hardest part of the game, as uh, when I'm as I mentioned previously. When I'm as I mentioned previously, when you turn the B uh, to move, you turn the directions, and so you can forget about it. Um, my husband suggested as an alternative to say, okay, I'm going to move, let's say five spaces uh, at the forward uh, left direction. You move the B in that at the forward uh, left direction. You move the B in that direction, and then you turn it uh, so that it faces, um, it ends up facing where it was uh, going. Uh, but that added more confusion to my parents. So I, I said, no, 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 just uh, because uh, as they are looking at me right now, it's not. I said, no, 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 just uh, because uh, as they are looking at me right now, it's not great. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I think that once you have figured that bit, uh, it's okay. But uh, for some, let's say, an experience with board games people or some people that don't have great experience with board games people or some people that don't have great uh, let's say special visualization it could be problematic but mostly for the movement part uh, overall the game has a 7 almost 7 uh, it's a 6.9 all the game has a 7 almost 7 uh, it's a 6.9 rating on board game geek and I think it's pretty fair um, the game is is, int is fun it's not very let's say groundbreaking uh, the bees are cute um, it can be played by literally um, it can be played by literally al almost anyone once you figure out the two or three uh, small uh, let's say uh, specific speci specific uh, things and uh, as Fen mentioned the insert on the previous game brew, uh, I will talk just uh, three seconds. Um, but the tiles, uh, the flower tiles are all pretty well secured inside. There are um, places to put all the little uh, wood tokens for the pollens. I really enjoy the fact that these pollen tokens are wood, uh, painted wood, and they're, they're, they're not very big. They're just good enough. At the center of the flowers, they don't have any incidents on the game. Big pollens don't score more, more points. Big pollens don't uh, count more for combination. There, I don't think I've seen any objective that ask you to have big pollens. So that's just one thing that I wonder. What big pollen, big honey, big fun. M maybe, I don't know. But for now, um, everyone was puzzled and asked, why are there four? Why? Why? And I couldn't answer. <laughs> yeah, that was going to be one of my questions. Was uh, what does the the big pollen? Yeah, that was going to be one of my questions. Was uh, what does the the big pollen do? And you've answered that. Uh, it seems like nothing. Yeah. Um, I I gotta say, like on the engineering front, this game is really well put together. I can see this as being definitely a game that will wow. Them. I can see this as being definitely a game that will wow people, um, at least visually. You know, you're going to whoops, people stopping and uh, walking by. You know, while they're walking by, they'll stop and look and be like, "Ooh, what's what's going on here?" Um, the bees are super cute. Uh, I had a question. The tiles appear to be in two different colors: the hexagonal flower and leaf tiles. Is there a relevance to that? Uh, for the colors, no. Uh, I didn't mention that from the leaves, but the leaves have some water droplets on them, and if your bee lands on the water droplet, the bee reflects. Okay, so the, the, the fact that some of them are like a lighter yellow doesn't mean anything. I think it just helps to place them. Right, yeah. Okay, so for setup. Yeah, there are a few mm. rules for setup, like you can't put uh, two color, two flowers of the same color adjacent, and you have to spread a bit the leaves. Visual aid again. I, I, some... I think unless it's being used at some point in a later expansion. Oh yeah, may, maybe uh, Big Pollen, Big Honey, Big Fun will, um, will include uh, extra rules for it. Yeah, maybe. Um... um how uh, you talked a bit about the difficulty uh, you talked a bit about the difficulty um that they have with the navigation and movement uh, it, it, how much of a pre-programming quite type thing is it because um like 
pre-programming movement is one of those things that makes me walk away from a game. Uh, Robo Rally, quite famously so. Uh, so is it uh, Robo Rally, quite famously so? Uh, so is it? Uh, I will uh, say that honestly, personally, I can count my next move, but I can't. Uh, I can't personally count further than that, as I just have a trouble figuring out how my bee is going to land on that. Just have a trouble figuring out how my bee is going to land on that, uh, facing that direction, and so then I will be able to go there. And there. I, I personally have a hard time to that, be because I just can't, in my mind, let's say, uh, save the position that the bee will end up in. Yeah. Okay, so stuff. But, um... Honestly, the game is light enough that if you play with your parents, you don't really have to care. But if you play with, uh, let's say, uh, two or three other hardcore gamers and they're like, yeah, I'm going to trash you and I'm going to get all the points, beware, beware. <laughs> Mm. So, the wall moving round? No, if uh, you want to go someplace where there is already a bee, it's like in Tokaido, you just can't. Right. So, so somebody potentially could block your flight path. Yeah, but uh, at the very start of the game, all the bees are in a central hexagonal tile and they all start going in a different direction. Find uh, yourself, let's say, conflicting with another bee for pollen uh, before the game gets pretty well advanced. Uh, mm -hmm. So y you have a few turns uh, al alone. Okay, yeah, I can see that typically the bees, if you played... We well, only play four players maximum, don't you? Uh, yeah, when... If you played... We only play four players maximum, don't you? Uh, yeah, when when my parents are there. And the setup of the game also is different depending on how many players you have. You don't mm -hmm. make the same pattern, so you have more pollen available when you are more players and less uh, when you are less players. Yeah, yeah, it's the closest anyone might be. Less players. Yeah, yeah, it's the closest anyone might be. Uh, after like initially, is about two two hex hexagons apart. That's that's a fair bit of space. Yeah, but yeah. as well, uh, as the um, um, center most flowers don't have the big pollen at the center, that's again one of the placement rules, the placement rules. Uh, mm -hmm. you, at the beginning, you want to try and go away from the center so that you try to pick these two pollen at a time. So that really adds to the, generally, you won't be conflicting uh, right away. Yeah, so the game by layout and reward encourages you to uh, bumble. Exactly. That's good. Yeah. Hmm. And I, I, uh, I won the game by a fair margin, I will say, because my parents were uh, busy figuring out how to move. And I mostly won because I collected uh, lots of teal pollen. And I mean, teal is my favorite color, and it was the one with a special common objective. So yeah, <laughs> teal. <laughs> Doing one of the patterns of uh, an, a pattern objective, and that scored me really lots of points. And meanwhile, I was explaining to my parents how to move their B. <laughs> Yeah, it sounds like, unfortunately, it's just not going to get on the table much with me. Um, probably not the target audience, but I will say the target audience, but I will say that I am the target audience for that kind of insert. If you're going to make an insert out of plastic, that's the kind of insert that I think is justified. It's holding everything in place, although I do agree maybe what they've used to encapsulate the bees is a little bit of overkill. Are those bees fragile? Used to encapsulate the bees is a little bit of overkill. Are those bees fragile? Um, the, the wings seems a bit not, not uh, let's say, not very thick, but just slightly enough to say, yeah, you're probably not going to break it uh, hmm. if you drop the bee. Uh, but I, uh, hmm. if you drop the bee, uh, but I wouldn't step on one. All right. <laughs> yeah, I think stepping on bees is something we all should avoid doing. Whether they are plastic or not, yes. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, go on. The insert probably doesn't fit the expansion. Oh, you're right. The insert probably doesn't fit the expansion. Oh, you're right. The, the pollen in the expansion is so big and the honey is so massive that, yeah, you wouldn't be able to contain it along with all of the fun. Well, I actually mean the real expansion that exists for the game, not the <laughs> oh. fiction of. Uh, do it. Oh. Fiction of. Uh, do it. Yeah. Butterfly expansion. 
Yes, where there you is. have a little butterfly. Oh, uh, this something. is cute. Uh, it's a mini, <laughs> mini expansion uh, giving versatility in how to store your nectar and help with uh, expansion uh, giving versatility in how to store your nectar and help with uh, end game storing. Mm. It's one butterfly, one rule book, and three tiles. Lovely. Yeah, I, I think you can still manage to fit that in, uh, but some places will be you will fit it in yeah. but under the insert more more likely mm. Mm. a butterfly is a real big cell it's a big draw that is but no 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 i i would have to be strong um <laughs> I love bees. yeah that's a, a nice game though um i i big points for that the engineering and making it so pretty and obviously very practical there's a lot of thought behind what they've chosen to do with the different colorations and and everything and it looks reasonably colorblind fresh there's no not red and green sitting next to here very much uh i would say that i am not sure either because that was lots of years ago when i was in uh, school uh, my first year of university and i had a partner in uh, lab classes uh, which said basically that he partner in uh, lab classes uh, which said basically that he couldn't figure out most of the colors anyway mm -hmm. yeah there are a bunch of different color blindness apart from the most common one of red green. Yeah. So yeah, yeah. Uh, um, wow. With this game, I did notice. Yeah. Uh, um, wow. With this game, I did notice one thing. Mm -hmm. Um, <laughs> because I feel a little bit stupid. You started explaining, and I was really confused. Like, wait, what? Huh? This doesn't sound like a game. Because when I read, okay, you're talking about bees, I thought, oh yeah, the bee game, honey bus. Yeah, the B game, Honey Bus. Yeah, the two games were out, I think, the same year uh, also. And uh, everyone was like, yeah, this is the year of the B. And... Yeah, I wasn't aware that there was a second B game, so... Um... Mm. Honey Buzz is one that I keep looking at. It's had good reports all round. It's, it looks nice, and it's a... The bees have discovered economics. Fantastic. Buy, sell, buy, sell. It looks more, let's say, sugary than bees. Uh, more uh, bling uh, than bees, but bees looks more... Um, oh, I, I'm a bit uh, simple, but not simplistic. You see, like, no, not going for fancy, but working stuff. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I get, get what you mean. Hmm. Well, maybe some point in the future, somebody will crack and get... I'm not going near it. Nope, nope. <laughs> I wouldn't be able to help myself. I can't. Yeah. Well, uh, I think that's all we have to say about bees, yeah? Yeah, I think. Yeah. Okay, well, that means we're out preferred podcast, or sometimes you can catch some of us in the wild over on Board Game Geek, or... Maybe even on Reddit. Sometimes, occasionally, I post a message there. Uh, so it's farewell from Audrey. Bye bye. Kara. Auf Wiederhören. And myself. And remember that the second E in Standy is for enjoy.